with different systems and then come up with different schemes. You have different things. But uh, most of the time, it's so much work just to get that and just the trace itself is somewhat exciting to put some meaning to it and then publish it. But we want to see exactly what, what kind of information we get out from those experiments and hopefully uh, design the experiment and to get even more information. So first, uh, well, knowledge of the people who did some of the work um, that I'm going to talk about. And these are my group members. Um, they work very hard. Hopefully they're and they're obviously listening to the lecture now. And um, of course, uh, thanks for the funding from the NSF, NIH, Walsh uh, Foundation, and Hamilton. So before I uh, talk about what we have done and how to interpret that, I would like to know your opinion. I want to ask you, you tell me something. So these are the uh, some typical four six syndrome. That's what we can get from manipulation. So people pull. I won't tell you what molecule that is here. And just pull, and then the molecule will extend, and the force will increase. In this particular case, there's a plateau here, and there's another plateau here, and then it will here. And there are some molecules probably have seen. The previous lectures, they have these uh, signatures, these characteristic curves. Some will have a bond, and some, these are, this is a different polling uh, scheme, so constant force. So there's a feedback loop, keep the force constant, and then the distance versus time. So uh, just by looking at this, do you see any? Anything looks similar to what whatever you're doing, granular systems, uh, field theory, whatever. Does it um, anything look familiar? You think you can uh, use what you know to interpret that? I'll have uh, I think I'll quickly take some notes. Maybe we we'll look. At, I mean, a lot of those theories are developed in different fields, right? I believe some of these could be used, but has to be used. Uh, anybody have any suggestion of any of these four? There's no necessary any right answer uh, for a particular problem. So, just ideas and suggestions. Anybody is brave enough? Say something looks like what you have seen before, and you use this to solve it. No? So these are really truly new, unique. Well, there are bits up there that look like kind of applies to the switching, right? Uh, maybe. I think this, this is a DNA, so you pull them apart. At the end, that's pretty much like that, right? So maybe something we'll use there if it's to analyze that. So, um, how about in terms of uh, molecule? Can you guess what these are? So three main categories, right? DNA, RNA, and proteins, right? So most likely the complicated one is going to be protein. proteins, right? The domains. So each one represents the domain on both. So pretty much. So you, you pull it, this is basically one domain ready on pull, and you pull it, and next domain on pull, and basically start over. So each peak is like a reset, with slightly uh, different uh, total length of the molecule. This one, well, it, let's not focus on this uh, peak yet, but like this smooth transition. So, it, so now we have two possibilities, right, DNA and RNA. And RNA forms hair bits, right? It's slightly more complicated. And so you would put which one for DNA, the simple one? Mm -hmm. This this would what's this? DNA. DNA, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really do much. You just unfold it. This one's actually single stranded, but double stranded is similar. You sort of unfold it and it has 
Does plateau instead of peak? So people consider that phase transition, so going from one phase to another. Uh, in RNA, there's a hairpin. So you unfold the hairpin similar to uh, protein, domain unfolding. So protein, even though the domain is a lot more complicated, the hydrogen bond and other interactions can fold into that. But usually, they are uh, approximated with a two-state model, folded, unfolded state. So even though the structure is complicated, but the, the, the process unfolding is just one step. So it's similar to um, not too long hairpin. And hairpin, I'll show you the structure. Actually, um, I don't know if I have this slide. But the hairpin, RNA hairpin is basically, if it's not too long, it's really considered a two-state model. It's either a hairpin structure or completely open. It does not really open like one by one. Okay, that's why we see these jumps. Excuse me, so when you look at the inside of, of that lower right figure, you see that strange this behavior, yeah, where the force curve goes back, I mean, it's back, back and forth. both devalued in both directions. Right, so basically there's, um, I think I will talk about a little bit more in the details in the next lecture, so it could jump between two states, so okay. it's almost, I don't know if it's exactly bistable, but basically at that force, if you look at the distribution, basically it's a, a equal probability will be an open and closed yeah. state, so it actually could jump. Yeah, so it looks like it's not all I see. So that's good. Yeah. So, so actually, so the, so in, in the bulk uh, studies, usually you just get okay. So 50 percent of chance is going to be open state, 50 percent chance is going to be closed state. But in the single molecule manipulation, you can actually see them jumping back and forth. But right now, people are not getting more information out of it other than, well, I can see them jump, jumping back and forth and then stay 50% of the time in one state, 50% of the other. But the, the, the details is not used. <coughs> so we're, uh, well, I'm hoping you, uh, some of you can develop something and tell us. What, what do you do? Why do people uh, concentrate on these biological molecules and not simpler uh, macromolecules like this polymer? Uh, the people did that in the, uh, in the beginning, yeah, so now we move on to that. Because a lot of polymer things are understood, yeah, I mean, there are still people doing it, but uh, the biological things is uh, not just the fundamental, right, everything. So the, about the molecule itself. So for example, this the polymer physics uh, have the behavior of all night chain. It's pretty much all understood. So, okay. Uh, I will give you basically one example, and which is what we like on the non uh world theorem developed by Jasinski as how we interpret data. In, in that case, we use the whole trace. And then, of course, there are different ways to interpret uh, many of these uh, data. And then um, I think there are more things to be developed. So I'll talk about the NCC quality. Uh, in, um, in terms of application of the genesis involving in interpreting external results. And um, I'll show you how we uh, do the free energy curve reconstruction. So if we talk about, say, RNA or protein coding, unfolding, this is a usual free energy curve. So go from folded state to unfolded state, and there's a transition stay in the train that you have to go over the barrier because the barrier you have to go through um, in most cases. And one way of thinking about that, it's not uh, really a theoretical basis, but this conceptually uh, was basically proposed by Bell uh, in, the, in the 70s. Uh, so you look at the force, you consider you put some work in, and then basically the net effect is just considered the free energy landscape was this, and then you fold it this way. So basically you fold down, so now the molecule will go to the unfolded state, right? Otherwise, it, 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 uh, it usually does not go to this is a small part of the state. But once you kill it, then the molecule will, uh, given time, will eventually move to that state. But uh, with the GNCC quality, now we actually have a theoretical basis. 
okay, not just to some phenomenological approach and say, well, okay, it looks like it might strap, extrapolate with a straight line. And then some people will say it's a straight line, some people will say it's not a straight line. But this is uh, exact. So we all know about the, the equality already. So the basically the, the work, we're going to measure the work here, and then use exponential averaging we to get three dimensions. And so it sounds easy, but in reality there's uh, some work needs to be done, not so trivial. So the first is so-called experimental test of density equality uh, was done um, by the Kusamanti's group. They, they used that to uh, study the RNA, use the optical trap to uh, study RNA unfolding. So the idea is to hold the molecule and let it unfold. And if you pull it slowly, so-called infinitely slowly, the uh, reaction is reversible. So you go forward and reverse, there is no history. So the basically these traces overlap. If you pull it faster, then you will have dissipation. You go forward and reverse, you're going to go to a different uh, trace. So, so using that, using this equilibrium, then you just get the work you put in directly. <coughs> and, and then you can estimate the, basically the work, which will be the free energy. And then you can see on this non-equilibrium measurements, so faster uh, polling rate, like 52 even. Um, yeah, the, the, the unit is a little bit funny. That's the optical uh, track setup. That's how they, uh, that, that's how, how they dis display the polling speed. But anyway, so they got uh, very similar free energy. So, so proof of this is how it works for single molecule experiments. Excuse me, I probably just going to expose my ignorance here, but I, I thought some problem with using Yarchinsky's equality in, in practice was that it's very difficult to get uh, the very rare events that should be included in, in your average. So that, that is actually, I will, I will talk about that today. So basically, if you pull too fast, that will be the problem. But you can see one can. Oh, depending on the system, right, the molecule, the relaxation time. One can actually pull it slow enough that it's near equilibrium. So in that case, you almost only need one, right? So if you increase the speed a little bit, you only need a few. So that's not such a really bad if you're working in near equilibrium regime. So, but then again, okay, so then what's the point of using Jasinski's squad? Maybe that would be the, the question. But, uh, so like the intermediate state, numbers, Usually you can, so if you don't have that like, order of magnitude uh, faster polling rate, then you could sample that. Hope the very best. Yes. Okay, perhaps I'm going to expose my ignorance as well, because I don't understand where the where you get the probability distribution. Where? Okay. Oh, the probability distribution for work. Okay, so that's what I'm going to talk about. Here. So that's the whole lecture. How do you get the probability distribution in the same track? So, well, well, we're going to do many, many experiments, right? So this is one. So there is a fluctuation. So if you do one, this is this is a trace. The next one. So this, in principle, this is uh, reversible. Then there are pretty much always going to be like this, ideally. But if it's a non-equilibrium, then each time the trace is going to be different. Then we have to average those. So how many do you average and call that your probability distribution? Right, so okay. depending on the polling speed. So we have a little bit of study of that. So a normal polling speed for proteins on the, on the order of hundreds. Uh, hundreds of trucks? And that's right. a reasonable estimation of the probability distribution? Yeah, it's not too bad. I mean, because we could uh, actually do it, like I said, do very close to equilibrium. In that limiting case, why do you want? Right? So you imagine you go slightly faster than that, you only need a few. So, so I, I will, we will I'll talk about it. Because we do experiments that are very different from simulations. The simulations do like thousands of times uh, the, the, the polling speed. The, a thousand, right, it, it basically a thousand times faster than we do experiments. So in that case, it's very difficult for them to converge and it's difficult to sample. Uh, the really bad. 
So I will show you some uh, the distributions. I think the hope is if you if you close to equilibrium, whatever that means, so it's you know that's an experimental test basically you have to test it. The hope is the distribution is so sharp that you get away with a few. Um, you know, of course you never know, but you know that's but that's not subject to experimental. And that's sort of case, how are you certain that you're sampling enough of rare events to make your I think that's a good question. Right, I mean, you, you so can never say for sure, but then we do more than one experiment. I'll show you the, the, basically what we're talking about there. So uh, the system we work on is the Titan. That's the muscle protein, that's the real thing. It's one of the biggest protein that we discovered. It's, uh, the overall, this is the muscle protein that connects from the Z line to the M line, and it's over 30,000 amino acids long. And then we focus on uh, one of the domains, I-27 domain, that was well studied. So this is a, a simulation of the I-27 domain, shown on by the Dalton uh, group. Uh, that this is the structure of I-27, and this is a molecular dynamic simulation. So it's just a possible uh, scenario of decoded, maybe you. Is that water? Is that water? In water, yes. And then we, uh, all this uh, experiment were done in, in solution with physiological conditions. Excuse me, this, this is the problem with the, the digression of what does Titan do? Uh, it's, a, it's a part of the, the muscle protein. Uh -huh. So this, uh, it pretty much holds the structure here. It, it's myosin. Myosin uh, is here. Myosin is the motor protein. So yeah. this is acting as a myosin basically walk on actin yeah. and does the contraction. Mm -hmm. uh, Titan is basically providing the passive <coughs> tension that just holding it there. Uh -huh. Right. It does not really actively just the end. Yes, so this is some kind of uh, like <coughs> not like a more structure. So that's basically the elastic part it could be extended and relaxed. Right. And but the, the rest here has this uh, mm -hmm well-defined structure. And there's a, uh, some people propose perhaps sometimes under high tension one of the domains will unfold to relax the tension of the rest. And then it will recall. Uh, in the, the uh, cardio muscle, not in the scalp. Oh, so this is only in cardio Well, this is also in skeletal muscles, but in skeletal muscles, people know it does not, the mm -hmm. domains don't really unfold. Mm -hmm. So probably cardio muscle it experiences higher stress. Okay, so this is uh, similar to seen uh, in Jasinski's uh, lecture. There's a spring here that's our can lever. It, it uh, follows the hook wall. And this is a rubber band. This is the molecule that follows the wall like chain rule, basically. So uh, here we have uh, a zero link icon domain. So, so we can see the repeat uh, signature. So we know that's uh, the domain unfolding. So we analyze the the the, the part of the curve that's away from the surface. So there's no surface effect. So this is a typical uh, force extension curve. Um, each one represents the domain unfolding. So in the end, when I did Jasinski's equality, we, we took the first peak and analyzed them. So we could uh, fit these curves for the one line chain equation. So it does follow this rule. So once it's unfold, it behaves like a polymer. And, and the, each one is a domain unfolding. The last one is the uh, molecule detached from the tip. Right, so the tip is holding the module relatively tight, so you can see this unfolding. So this is how, how we do it. So we have uh, those traces. So we did, we took hundreds of them. Obviously, we took thousands of them. But anyway, uh, eventually we analyzed it. So now we order hundreds, and we align them. And this will basically. Uh, based on this part, the alignment, so we shift it and align it this way, and then we see there is distribution. Then we use the Jasinski. So if we just average, then with normal average, so took average for this, 
then this is a curve again. If we use the Jelinski's average, then we group them at three different speeds. This is just one speed. Okay, three different speeds. And they all pretty much uh, converge to one. So there's some indication. Of course, we can prove it. How but how do you converge? So, so basically, we just uh, calculate them with Jelinski's equality, and then we get the curve. And then we have a different speed, and we calculate them that, and then we get the double curve. They just overlap. So of course we can't prove they that they converge, but it basically indicates that they converge here. And then if you look at the distribution, you can see we do this just uh, basically a smooth spine. This is a bit. It's not in any particular shape. Uh, so the, if you look at the distribution, we have reasonable. So we can look at the, the work distribution. We don't have like a big hole here. So it's reasonably smooth. Excuse me. Yes. Um, uh, there's something strange in this. Uh, for first and second, uh, 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 the first one, picture, uh, the, the force has been changing after about uh, 29 years. But for second one, uh, for second one, the real energy has a sudden change uh, uh, smaller, smaller than the uh, 29 meters. So it's the sums uh, that the two oh. meters are. Right. So okay. So that uh, well, okay. Those are details in here. Basically. Oh, the first one is, uh, is high. Oh. Right. Well, right. That, that yeah. Um, well, okay. Because we do. Uh, uh, time series. So it's approximately here, uh, the line, but you get the white microns per second, it's actually uh, similar. It is time, but it's, it's actually, because it's one microns per second, it's actually. Uh, well, actually, it is also 29 seconds. Yeah, it is still 29 nanometers. Because the right. uh, uh, speed is, uh, is one micron per second. Right, it's it's almost almost pretty much a line, similar. Right, but okay, so that that's the thing that I want to talk about. So basically, if, if you want to use students' use equality, once it goes through this uh, basic transitions, they embrace uh, the information law, so we can analyze it past that. Also, okay. thing where you were saying before that as we you know, reduce the speed, of course, things should be on the equilibrium and then the free energy versus extension, things are converging. But in the probability distribution, I'm not sure they converge there. Um, so, you know, you have, you have the point 0.1 and point 0.05 on the free energy versus extension track, that seems to be the same curve, but in the probability distribution, they're still different. <coughs> well, they, they should be different, right? The, that's the. The distribution does not converge, right? The distribution. Well, eventually, but no, that's what you're saying. That in the end, you just want to sample the uh, low, the low pulling rate, of the right? To basically see the equilibrium. Right, right. But one one micron is not used. No, that's right? not. But the point of five and point one. Right. Well, so point one and point oh five. I think point oh five is close to equilibrium. Point one, not quite. It's so it's not completely converged. Well, how do we know that it's not converged? Well, I mean, we don't know for sure. This is an experimental data. It says the trend is consistent, but I, I, I can't tell you like this, they actually converge here. But, but, but in the curves of free energy, you, know, you can see that the word is and is very different from that. From the free energy, so I uh, would indicate that even the pulling speed of 0.05 is far from equilibrium. Right, 0.05 is still not equilibrium. I think it was near 0.01 it would be close. So, anyway, I'll, I'll talk about right, point, we, we went uh, down uh, below that point speed. 0.05 is not equilibrium. But even, even 0.01 is not completely equilibrium, but basically. Uh, the experimental error was on the other of five to ten percent. So basically, anything within five to ten percent does does not make any difference for us. Yeah. Can, can you get this unfolding event under equilibrium conditions? 
Can I? Can you can you measure the composing event under equilibrium conditions? Uh, close to equilibrium. That's what we're going to do, uh, show. I'm going to show you later, but not completely equilibrium. I think in in uh, the protein is it's hard, but basically uh, almost equilibrium. Equilibrium basically for us because if the error is within five or ten percent. Then you can consider it, right? Because you nothing is uh, infinite time, right? It's n it's never going to happen, like strictly speaking, it's never going to happen. But slow enough that we don't really see any difference. Yes. Do you have a folding distribution? Folding is difficult. So, like I said yesterday, protein does not really fold. Uh, it it we people don't really see uh, like the the peak from the folding because it does not like fold slowly and then go over the barrier. So you have to relax the whole whole protein to a very small extension and then they fold there. It does not like fold a little bit <coughs> little by little. Right. So if, if you don't if the extension is too long they just can't fold. And then you have to go basically you go this trace. It does not go this way. At least it's for only it, it comes back flat. This. So I don't know if you wait forever, if you may see it briefly, but basically no one's ever seen that. So, even if, so if, you, if you do the experiment where you fold and you, then you extend, you unfold a single domain, I mean, you relax it just a little bit, yes. and you wait, mm -hmm. you can't see it refold? Uh, if I hold the molecule, so, I mean, I, I, so I imagine your force extension curve from the previous slide. Uh, and so I just want you to extend and unfold a single domain mm -hmm. and then relax the uh, separation back to uh, a point where it would be in the folded state. Here, yes, that's what. Well, I mean, not, not all the way back, you know, like the 10 microns. And then wait, okay. will it refold? Yes, it will. And so but you can measure that, but that force as it, as it refolds. But it doesn't show up in this, it does not have a peak. It, it just has this basically. Well, from here. Um, I mean, so you so, can, so if, if you relax it, so, so you extend it to 22 microns and it unfolds. Right. And then you relax it back to 15. And you watch uh, it refold, you can't see the peak coming back. I mean, I mean, in principle, you should, you should see a force as it tries to refold. No, so if we come back here, the force is at zero. It does not go up there. Right, but as it refolds, I mean, it should, so it should, you should see a peak come back to the force required for that particular extension, but it doesn't stay. Okay, so we don't usually, uh, so instead of 15, I don't know how long it would take for them to refold, I don't know for sure. But no one's seen that. Usually you have to relax all the way here. So if you have a little bit of tension in the molecule, um, I don't know, in this particular case, you will be able to refold or not. I don't think people will try that. Um, basically, the protein needs to work against the external load. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how long it will, if ever it will happen. So usually, it will be basically no load. The protein will be refold. So there's some, quite a bit of history. So you have to yes. Spread stretch it a little too much before it snaps open and you better relax it almost all the way before it yes. folds back. Right. So because of protein folding, like um, I mentioned a little bit during my first lecture and probably I can show it in the next lecture, there's a particular protein that behaves like a spring. Then you can do what you really want to do. So you like at any given point to do that. But protein folding, usually protein is not like a protein. So if you stretch <coughs> a little bit, if you watch it, it, it just falls apart. And then, and then it requires no work to, to extend a little bit because you just drop the structure. So you can't just let it re, uh, shrink the distance a little bit and expect it to refold to where it has folded. It just does not work that way, right? So protein usually is two-state model, right? Folded, refolded, folded or refolded. So you don't have... I think if you have an intermediate state here, maybe, I think if not, I'm not sure it's possible.
But one can do that with DNA and RNA. Uh, <coughs> yeah, that will be. Uh, I'll show you an example of the DNA because it's more of a gradual change. So, so this is it. This is one thing uh, we use the histogram method. It was developed at the Hunger level, uh, 201, specifically for uh, using Jurinsky's equality to analyze single molecule manip manipulation data. And I think the people doing simulations are familiar with this. Basically, uh, it's just a, a binning method to convert uh, the data we took in, in time, basically it's forward versus time now, to the distance. But conceptually, it's uh, very important, like uh, Jurinsky talked about. <coughs> basically, in Jurinsky's equality, they use lambda here, right? So the word here is the word basically put into the system. But but remember, Jurinsky's equality says this, that equality is good for two equilibrium states, right? Start with the equilibrium state, end with the equilibrium state. But how come we can reconstruct the whole curve? Because uh, we didn't stop and let the system relax to equilibrium at any given time, right? It's default. So it's non-equilibrium. That's the whole point. It's non-equilibrium measurements. So why can we use that at any point in the only way? The heat is, um, what we're interested in is this Z, end to end distance, molecular end to end distance. So this is the, the parameter lambda minus Z, and the difference here is the spring, the cantilever bending. So basically, in Jurinsky's quality, it only cares about lambda. So you pull the molecule at a given lambda, okay? So if you really wanted the system to relax to a little bit, you pull it some distance and you wait there, let the family relax to equilibrium, right? But during the waiting time, you hold the, the stage, basically the distance between the stage and this lever, constant high lambda. So we're not doing any work to the system. Then for Jurinsky's equality, you're not going to put, change any of the value you put in the equation. So basically it doesn't matter, you don't have to do it. But of course, there's no free lunch, there's some information to be lost basically this thing. So, so but the the fluctuation size is not that big and then all uh, we calculate it and then um, compare. Most people just use FDX, just this is a force and then this converts uh, that to extensions so this area here and then we saw some of the Bosomonti's favorite is just basically compute the area and consider that work, that's pretty much within like 5% uh, error compared to using the, oh, oh, sorry. compared to using the, the exact method, this, this one. But this one has, is conceptually uh, important because, I mean, basically, you can use that when the, the, the end state is not uh, equal to Of course, it, equality has something, but this in this equation that we're using it, we do want the, the end state to be equal to But in this particular setting, these parameters, we don't have to work. So, so this is what happens. So one, once we pull it here, we can, we can uh, reconstruct the free energy curves. But once they go over the barrier, that's the bottom. So this is basically the system, like a reset, because the the cantilever is snapping back, right? So when we record here, <coughs> the force looks like that, even though basically there's no force on the wall, right? So that's basically this little bit complication, like if you're talking about force and But anyway, so basically when it unfolds. The molecule, once it unfolds, these hydrogen bonds are broken. It wants to go slightly extended because if you do look at the, the free energy um, curve, once it goes over this barrier, it wants to go to this state. And so this slightly more extended state actually has a lower free energy, right? So it actually wants to basically extend. In principle, it wants to push the gain lever. And of course, in reality, you can't because it, it, the molecule that can lever that is one that you can pull it on one one D. But if the molecule won't extend, it can go to uh, or X Y Z. So some of the energy is probably lost in the solution. 
But it appears uh, if we just use the cantilever position as the force, this is going to appear like there's a force. There's actually no force on the molecule. So basic physics is when the cantilever releases its energy uh, to the, <coughs> basically the system to report it. So if we integrate it, we keep integrating it, then this is going to look, keep the, basically the curve is going to keep going, right? So it won't make sense because if the real uh, free energy landscape for the molecule, it has to go down. Basically, the force needs to go to negative, right? If we, if anything, you want to go on, on this um, free energy curve, you go, the, the force, you just see, take the delta G to uh, delta Z. G to Z, you will have to go negative. But we never see negative force, right? So that's because the experiment. So basically, we can't really recover it through some, any accuracy this part of the, the free energy. So basically, only works uphill. Yes. But it, that no, there is not necessarily an accurate curve for the free energy. The only thing that you require, it doesn't have to go down. It can still go up in the extended state. Uh, the molecule, in, in reality, once it's unfolded, it will go down, right? That's the holding folding, it should go down. I guess I'm, I'm but I don't see it. For me, it's still not clear why you think that you should be observing a negative force. I agree that you should be observing a negative slope in the force squared, but not a negative force. Well, if you if you if you walk on the if you want to track this free energy curve, you have to see a negative force. Otherwise, you're not tracking, it, right? In this. This, you have to have to write that this is the negative slope, that's the force. So I'm saying, but so this way we're not following this, we're following something, uh, we're adding the effect of the candy basically. Yes? Uh, in any other uh, single molecule experiments, has it been observed this negative force? Other single molecule experiments? Yeah. This negative force, has, has it been observed? No, we only see that the, n n nobody is, because, well, negative force sometimes is due to some other things like uh, a repulsion or something, but unfolding, no. Because basically, well, so the point here is this, we are actually not seeing the, the, the okay, so the, the not just the, the force we should see. This we are not even seeing the force on the molecule. This is just cantilever. Basically, when the molecule unfolds, it basically is like it's, it broke, right? So it's very loose now. So basically, there's no force on the molecule. It should go follow this. But the cantilever at this position is highly bent. Now it needs to spring back, right? So you need to travel that distance. It just physically it cannot just have a quantum jump. So it, during that, that process, the cantilever basically releases energy, and it, 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 the position is like this, but there's no force on the molecule. So basically during that time, the force on the molecule is not uh, the force on the spring, basically. So basically we only measure the force on the spring, we assume that force is the same as the force on the molecule. But during this time, it's not. It's not balanced. Yes. So it seems like you can use that as a measure of the energy that's dissipated by the spring into the medium, right? And then you can use that as a, an expression of, you know, you can from that extract the heat that you dissipate into the medium. But that, this is by the cantilever, well, not by yeah, the molecule. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, but, but not by the molecule. Right. I'm right, but, but we, we want to know what's dissipated by the molecule, and which is going to be very small. So as you can see, this. It's a very small amount going downhill. If we so what we did is that we okay so with frequency quality we have only reconstructed the energy curve up to this, and then after that we don't know. And I just took the known uh, value. People already know the the free energy difference between mm -hmm. the folded and unfolded state. It's the Boltzmann distribution. You can get the uh, free energy. Then uh, we know the transition state, then we can reconstruct. Then we see this is very small. Basically, it's there, but it's very difficult to recover from the experiment. So, I mean, you can't just track, I mean, you can't just track up the heat dissipated due to the spring and, and then compare that to the warm up chain level and then extract the heat dissipated by the molecule. Uh, ideally, that's true. 
We're trying to do that a little bit, but I think that the arrow is still large enough. So the the cantilever, the, the subtraction here, it needs to be, because the, the molecule is just a very small amount. So any arrow we have here, because, because at this bending, the cantilever is slightly different at uh, the transition state, each realization. So we need to uh, know exactly how much at that position the cantilever uh, the woman subtract and we try that a little bit. Uh, we can see some trends and then maybe get some uh, value but that's not going to be accurate enough. But I think in principle it is. In practice you need to have pretty accurate uh, uh, measurements to get that. So in principle it's there. That's right. So maybe there is a better way to, to do the estimate and we can recover that. That would be great. But I think some of the, uh, maybe it's just the, the accuracy problem. We will try that a little bit. But it really depends on how we do it. I think the, the value basically changed too much. So it basically does not really have a good meaning. Uh, so let me just see if I understand this right. So the the, when the molecule unfolds essentially the can the better spring springs back sort of like an overband of the harmonic oscillator, right? But what you're saying is that most of that damping is due to the fluid and the spring and so on and very little of that damping is actually due to the to the plastic deformation of the of the molecule. Correct. Could you possibly measure the, the damping due to the medium and the cantilever by, by doing uh, free oscillation experiments with the cantilever in the medium? That's a clever idea. So, right, what well, we would like to do that. So we try a little bit, trying to do some oscillation, but it really introduced a lot of uh, experimental complexity. So I think eventually that will be the future goal. <coughs> and then people, some people are trying to do do that. Not necessarily getting the right. But Sounds like a typical theorist's experiment. Well, uh, well, that, that's actually <coughs> good. Just in reality, it's not that easy, but it may, be, it may not be that hard. It just uh, that's not the first thing we need to do. Like, we just try to do it. it it's not that simple. It's not like a right away you can get it. It requires some careful setup and the calibration. Because when you oscillate things, a lot of things happen. Right, the whole system. You know, it's like the, the fluid is oscillating sometimes, and then, and then it just introduces a lot of things when you want to calibrate carefully. Well, I'm almost in, always in awe that experimentalists can extract anything from it. <laughs> <laughs> right, actually, so that, 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 that's something we're, we're thinking about, but it requires some work, right? So maybe in a few years, mm -hmm. talk to me again in a few, few years, maybe we'll have it. So have some groups in the UK done that experiment with Titan? Yes, lady, can we just? Uh, how are these done? No, no, no. Some groups in the UK, I think, have done the experiment. Yes. Described, right. Yeah. right. They they, they, right. So they're. So they're, they're not getting these uh, free energy, they're just getting some mechanical problems. It's, it's, right, so they get some numbers, uh, I, I guess basically like the acid model, that type of thing. So no one knows what the exact number is, so we don't know the accuracy. Yes, you can, one can get some numbers, but how accurate it is, that's the, that's the question. Right. So in this particular case, you want to be reasonably accurate to get a meaningful number here. So. That's why. Good. Seems like um, we we'll have some questions here, and, and then we get to the. Okay, so this one with this with some approximation, which is so we're demonstrating what kind of information you can get from this. So the advantage of this is we now have the directly measure delta g. Usually the protein folding in these field people don't measure delta g, and then we actually measure the information up to the transition state. I have to say uh, the the, the, accurate, the number, the accuracy of the number, and that, that may be the problem, but the idea is the information we get here, so if we know the distance, and we know where the, the photostate is, 
So basically, we took it, in this case, we just uh, demonstrated, we took the number from other measurements, also a single molecule, the distance between folded and transition state is about uh, six angstroms, and then we can calculate the energy, the, basically it's a barrier high, it's only over 11 pounds per mole. So that's basically similar to what people estimate. No one ever had the accurate numbers because all the experiments were done in the bulk it was done with the kinetic studies, right? So what they did is they made the protein unfold, so under uh, denatured conditions, and so they start some time and then they, they count how much at any given time how much or unfolded, right? And then they plot that and they estimate the rate constant. Uh, so they have the rate. And then and from the rate they get, they assume, so they get the rate here, K, and then they assume a free exponential factor here very often, you see the, uh, from, if we go from transition state theory, that's like an end of the clock, and then if we go uh, by the uh, Kramer series, like on the order of 10 to the minus 6 or 7. So it's a thick range. And so ba basically, this is just estimate, no one knows. And then you get double G. So in our case, we have a me measurement of the delta G directly. However, the accuracy is, uh, the uncertainty is large. Basically, it's mainly from the distance. So this is to demonstrate the type of information one can get. <coughs> because when the protein coding, one can never really directly measure the of the Yes? So you are stretching the protein in one particular direction. Can yes. you directly compare the result of unfolding free energy to the unfolding free energy by heating? OK, so that's what I'm going to talk about. <coughs> Next, well, I don't know if I have time to get to that today. Uh, so, at the end, so maybe I'll have to save this for my next lecture. This is where you're asking, are they, where, which path they're taking, are they similar? So we have some uh, experiment that indicate they're probably similar, but may not be exactly the same. Basically, this one, so, okay, so we're a theorist, you know. Uh, in this particular case, we have a constraint, which is end to end distance, right? But the other um, um, denaturant studies, they don't have that, and that's the only difference. So we'll go into that. So before I uh, get into that, I mean, uh, there are some uh, studies we did with the velocity convergence. So, so the first one was published uh, in and the physical review of letters, and of course the, uh, the idea of getting the entire free energy landscape, even though in this case it's mostly it looks like a 1 by 10 case, so it is a straight uh, this curve like this. But in principle, if there are some interesting features, one will actually see that. So the idea is we have this old curve, we don't toss all the data, we actually use them. We can actually see how they go up here. And so, if one, ideally, if one can do that for protein folding, then you can get the whole energy landscape. And this, uh, at this point, of course, the, the accuracy still needs to be improved. And then, so, of course, the protein folding is related to Alzheimer's disease, right, protein misfolding. So, and then that, there's just an indication, like, we do sophisticated non-equilibrium statistical mechanics, but if you can relay your uh, results, <coughs> to some uh, problems that you are interested in, then, um, then you get, um, like a science news, they talk about this, they just talk about Alzheimer's disease. Right? They look cool and they have Alzheimer's disease. Right? Of course, we're not really, um, I mean, we're not developing a drug for Alzheimer's disease. But anyway, so, but that's all our physics can hope, like, in the distant future, right, this is the, lays the, the foundation for people to understand the process. So, so now I'll get to uh, try to answer some of the questions we asked earlier and the velocity of the convergence. So we did them in a, a different pulling pull rate. So, so this is what it looked like. Um, the, I think the uh, slower is the second point oh two we did. And then uh, all the way to like 10 uh, about 5 actually, microns per second. 
So when it, we pull above 10 once to start see some hydrodynamic effects, so, and also that becomes so uh, non equilibrium so almost does not converge. So basically, we don't want to go beyond that. So you can see they don't think this fall exactly on top of each other, but they do converge in re within reasonable um, uh, accuracy. So we did the folding rate from 0.02 to about 5 microns per second. And then 0.02 is close to equilibrium, but not exactly. Right? But basically, within our limit, if we, because of all other systematic error, it's a limited accuracy to about 10%, then if it converges within 10% for us, that's good enough. Right. So maybe you want to go that ten you know, go beyond that ten percent to like one percent you need to sample a lot more. But for us since everything else is, there are other factors limiting the accuracy. So ten percent that's good enough for us. Then it's reasonable. And if we look at how how many curves we need to get. So this is a distribution we get out from that. So we can see the high uh, polling velocity, the distribution is wider. Right, and then shift it to a higher work, and the lower one, sure, is, is a little bit narrower, but then sure, the, the sampling, less of the sampling, so the distribution is not this smooth. The, um, the slow speed is pretty difficult to achieve. Then, um, so we have we have the rough estimate. We never know exactly when it converges, but. We just uh, calculate, we have the curve, and then we calculate that uh, barrier. And then the, we sort of define the barrier does not change uh, by more than 10% for some time. We say, oh, probably converge. Okay, we can prove it. But basically, we think our uh, uh, limit that's basically good enough. Of course, this one has its, uh, uh, its problem. Sometimes it looks like it converges and it will jump afterwards. But anyway, so it pretty much stabilized around here. So these are experimental data, right? So it does go with the polling speed, and then we sort of fit it with an empirical equation. It, it goes like this. It's, it's just empirical. So it does seem like it will go uh, this, like exponentially, or exponentially this way. So you can imagine if we pull it uh, five microns per second, you need like several thousand. And then that's the case. It's very difficult to have it converge, to sample enough, basically uh, your language is like you can't really sample the rare event. You can't prove you already sampled the rare event, right? But within the normal condition when people uh, do a polling rate sign under the 0.5, 1 microns per second, several hundred is good enough. I mean, several hundred <coughs> curves, actually, these are very good curves, but several hundred is actually a lot of work, but it's doable. Because one has to use it. So, and so actually, the conclusion somehow is if you can do it slowly, that's basically what simulations people already concluded. If you can do it slowly, do it slowly. <laughs> that's that's how I feel. But sometimes, like when we have practical problems, like instrument drift, right? So at least you don't have to worry about it in simulation. In the experiment, we have to worry about the instrument. If you do an infinite slowly, the error is eventually becomes a, a too large and can be corrected accurately. Or in the molecule, we really cannot uh, detect the, the dip in the surface forever. Right? So that will limit the, the, the time one can spend on the experiment. So, uh, so as, uh, for some system, maybe it's still advantageous using that. But I would say, and then after, so basically, after we study this, so that's one purpose is to understand exactly what information one can get out from these single molecule manipulation and what one can use to do this problem. Then we realize, I think perhaps a system like DNA will be uh, ideal. Basically, a system that does not go over the barrier and, and they can't even snap. Basically, if it goes sort of uphill like that, it will be, will be better because then we can construct a three-inch curve all the way. And also, if we can do it slowly, we'll do it slowly rather than uh, average. But if we want to do it reasonably slowly, and it will not uh, take more than like, right, maybe 10, 20 would be enough. 
Although in the slow speed, uh, 10, 20, 30 hertz is actually pretty difficult to achieve. Too. So, and then especially they need to be similar enough that you can average it. So that's probably the biggest uh, hurdle here. That's why we have not seen so many uh, publications and experiments using the Zenzi Evolve, right? So I think, uh, so this is another, uh, it's a, a demonstration of how it converges the number of uh, realizations. So this is uh, 0.5 micron per second. So in the the first 10, 20, it's uh, right. We didn't sample the very advanced, so the the overestimate is a value. And then eventually, once you get to around 100, 200, the value is sort of the number sort of stabilized. So. I mean, we don't know, for sure converge, it converges, it does seem like it's not changing anymore. Um, I think this is, uh, to answer a different question like you're talking about, I think that would mean sometimes I'll save this for the next lecture. This actually was a big uh, uh, debate. So. It's a very, very, a little bit interesting. I think in the beginning, people try to, to develop this method. So people have this manipulation method, and then you get the folding, unfolding uh, energy barrier, and the kinetic, and then compared to bulk studies, oh, we've got the same number, perfect, it must be correct, it's a good technique. And then after um, like five, ten years, and this, uh, people already accept this method, this involved manipulation, and people started getting different numbers compared to bulk, right? And then, and then there was arguments that mine is more accurate than yours. And then there was an argument, right? So there's people saying, hey, in the, in, the, in the cell, you never have a denaturant, denaturant protein, right? So if you use the denaturant, you're not measuring something that happened in the cell. So mechanical force is more closer to a reality. But, um, and then there was back and forth, and then you look at the paper, there was a comment the answers to come and then it's like a big fight. But uh, I don't think that's uh, really, in, um, basically the question, that I, the answer is actually basically like some of the question you asked. The, it's not so much about how you perturb the system. Basically both methods extrapolate the, uh, the number to zero. So the nature, in principle, you go to the zero denature concentration force you're trying to get into a zero force limit, right? So the, the force is actually not a parameter. But even that, assuming both or the uh, method of done extract correctly, still there is this limit for a single molecule. We do have this end to end distance. So uh, the, the, the restriction was put on a single molecule that's in addition to uh, the record. So we'll, we'll talk in the details about this in the next lecture. But uh, the comp uh, well, I'll, I'll save something so you will still come by the next lecture. But <laughs> but it, it is uh, in principle these are not exactly the same, which is so we can say both are right. They are not the same, but they are not too different, at least for most systems. <coughs> Thank you very much. You already had some questions? Yeah. Uh, so from the last graph you, you showed there, it seems to me like, yeah, this, this one, that the denaturing temperature must be quite high here, or, or will denaturing just essentially happen as soon as you get some significant pro probability down, down towards zero force? So which point is I, mean, I was thinking what I was thinking was I would in order to find the denaturing temperature I could extrapolate these uh, the, the curves on the right to zero force, but that that would get me a very high temperature. Well, okay, so this is not really to extrapolate the denaturing temperature. So basically we do we denature we uh, so we're not trying to uh, get say what temperature you can use to denature the protein. We just want to see the trend. So we, we use the force to denature the protein. And 
the force required is going to change with the temperature. Right. But I don't really know if you um, extrapolate that, what it means. So basically at any given temperature, you can, in nature, well, you will change the population between yeah. boiling and boiling state. Right? Uh -huh. So I guess if you want to tilt it all the way, maybe you do have to go to very high temperature. So I think if you're talking about a zero force limit, that means yeah. like it tilt it all the way, maybe, um, I don't know. So usually you just tilt, tilt it like, right, so one by one. You know. But your muscles have made, melted long before everything is in a teenager. Possibly, right. <laughs> or too hot. So that's a rupture force in the ground, or what is it? Okay, so I still don't to uh, save this for the next talk, but now, since I show it, we have all the questions. Yes, that's the rupture force they used to plan, and then, so, just uh, so we see the trend, and then we also have a free So, I hope you'll come back next lecture and we'll talk about this. Right, because this is, this is the experiment, and then there's the question, there's always a lot of questions about this, and this, this, this uh, will you measure it? So we'll have a, often I have a question, like, if you measure this, is this is meaningful, right? And people say, oh, this is 1D. Uh, okay, it's a Q uh, physics, but uh, in reality, it's, it's what the molecule is doing. So we're trying to answer that question. The eruption force is the maximum force you measured in the ABM experiment, or did you, did, did you smooth the, how did you define the eruption force? Well, we would measure it from the, the, the data. Yeah, so basically the force. So it's just the largest one you do? Pretty much, yes. So we try not to do too much with smoothing out of things, so things are directly from the experiment, because we do something and then, so that will depend on how we smooth it, right? And then that's a little bit dangerous. So we try to just use uh, experimental data. Then we'll have more noise, but then we know that's noise from the experiment. You said that uh, using a probe which is as slow as possible is the best choice. Is that really the only best choice? Do theorists think about what alternatives would be to have a better protocol? Um, better protocol. So, are you talking about like operating or other things? The thing I'm thinking about is depending on the problem, you have a different work distribution. And uh, the way to go that you have to, you know, you have to adjust your experiment to this particular uh, work distribution. Like in Monte Carlo simulations, when you have certain rare events, you adjust the way you do the algorithm to really capture those rare events. Okay, so in our experiment, there's not too much we can change, and so basically at this point, just the pulling ray. So they just, the rate needs to be slowed down, slowed up the P uh, equilibrium. And so, and then there's another way people do it is a constant force, but that has the feedback and the density equality would work because the, the pulling schedule needs to be predetermined. It cannot be uh, de dependent upon what the molecule does. So we can't have the feedback. So basically, we could have a different polling schedule as long as it's pretty determined and they're all the same. So maybe, uh, I suppose if some theorists tell us, right, so we, right, we can't really just try different polling schedule and what polling schedule. If there is something that makes sense, so perfect. If any of you can, uh, suggest some schedule that will uh, allow sampling the uh, rare event or improve accuracy to some extent. Don't want to see the possibility. I want to take the question. Is, is protein folding mode always reversible? In the sense that you always pull and then on to, and they fall to the same set as initially, or do you ever have to switch to another protein at the same time? Uh, in our protein, I think particularly this muscle protein, it does unfold, I think, to 98%. And I think most of the protein will unfold. But large proteins, sometimes we know it needs to chaperone to the fold within the problem. So, is that it? Right. Right. So, in, actually, in our experiment, we actually try different proteins each time. Right. So, 
I mean, we have the refold. There is a complication. They didn't refold properly, even though it was refold. Uh, it's a rare event, but you, right, you do have the error. And so what can what can do in our case, we do a different protein. We can also do folding. And then I think Chris had some results actually was from folding. So I'm a little confused as to why the protein unfolding experiment is a better test in terms of physical quality than the RNA unfolding and refolding experiment. That's the key. We never say we're testing Jasinski's quality. We assume Jasinski's quality is correct. We're applying Jasinski's quality to solve a protein problem. Yes. I would not say we can test it. It's, it's not accurate enough to be able to test it. Would it be possible to test Terzinski's equality on the on the uh, RNA system? Well, uh, that's what Mr. Monkey did. That's what that paper is about, testing Terzinski's equality. So um, that's uh, ba that's the basic. Uh, basically, they just say, well, you do it reversibly or irreversibly. With you do it reversibly or you do it irreversibly with Terzinski's equality, you get the same result. Test. But I think that it might be a real test you need to get a clean system like these. I think people did that with big beads and yeah. mirrors. Right. Yeah, so I think in biological things, error is large, but intrinsically with the complex and all of you can only get a certain accuracy. And this is a good demonstration that it could work in biological systems. And we assume that I work so we're going to demonstrate it to apply to real systems and what kind of information you can get. Right. We're not there. Okay, I see no more questions. Let's think Jing Wa again.